Zadrizes bus darīs, kas tev. I don't know about you all, but I'm really excited for Winds of Winter. In this video, I want to discuss uh, what's up with the release date, give my own prediction for a release date, talk about some of the latest not a blog posts, and then also discuss my favorite two plot lines that I'm most excited to see when the Winds of Winter finally gets here. Please, if you enjoy this video, do me a massive favor and subscribe to my channel here on YouTube. Anybody that you're a fan of, any kind of content creator that you enjoy watching their videos of and you haven't pulled the trigger yet, go ahead and subscribe. It's one of the best things you can do for their YouTube channel. Also, slap a like on this video if you don't mind. Like goal is going to be 420. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> Okay, so before I get started, this is kind of a lighthearted and fun video. If you want something to prep you for House of the Dragon Season 2, just go check out some of my most recent videos that I've put out. The one specifically linked down below in the description is the most latest one, and I think you'll get a kick out of that if you want more uh, prep for House of the Dragon Season 2. Okay, so first things first. Like, the most recent Not A Blog post, which if you're unaware, Not A Blog is the uh, journal site that George will... 100% confirmed announced the release date of Winds of Winter. George has had a bit of a track history of not exactly meeting deadlines on time. So he's actually come out several times and told us that when Winds of Winter is ready and it's got a set release date, he's not playing any games. He's going to let us know on this Nada blog site. So one of my daily routines, one of my morning rituals, so to speak, is to go and check Nada blog, right? Because regardless of whatever articles or for instance, like better yet whatever videos you see on youtube mine included you'll know from george first right so before you waste any of your time always go check not a blog but for winds of winter the most recent not a blog post was on may 7th of this year and george called the post strike about uh, two-thirds of the way through the article he says wins remains his number one priority Right, so in that not a blog post, George was talking about the writer strike that's happening in Hollywood, and he mentions in the article how people think that the writer strike could potentially affect his book, The Winds of Winter. Right, the biggest potentially fantasy book of all time. In my opinion, it will be my favorite biggest fantasy book of all time. I feel like the wait in between Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring won't be as long. And the fact that I read, or have read rather, <laughs> the Song of Ice and Fire main series, Game of Thrones, Clash of Kings. A uh, Storm of Swords, Feast of Crows, and A Dance of Dragons. I've read all those books seven times. I will probably b never be as excited for any other book ever as I am for the Winds of Winter. And I'm sure there's millions of people out there that probably feel the same way, right? So that was the most recent update. George told us back in May, which was like exactly two months ago to the date, right? And when this video comes out, um, George told us that Winds is his number one priority. Right? So in my opinion, it's really important um, and really awesome. It's good news to hear because remember just a year ago, and I know that sounds like a long time ago, but writing this book uh, is not the same as writing another book, right? So I'll just leave it that at that. But like about a year and a half ago, George told us that he completed entire POV character arcs for the Winds of Winter. One of them being Tyrion freaking Lannister. And I don't know if you know this, but Tyrion has the most POVs out of any character in all of the A Song of Ice and Fire POVs. Tyrion is the key piece to finalizing a book, like finishing a book. If you've completed Tyrion's arc, and the way that George writes is writing like several characters, uh, POVs at one time so he can make sure he doesn't get his timelines skewed and he wants it to all sort of converge together, right? Uh, the way that he writes is when he finishes a main player like Tyrion's POV, all the other ones sort of fall into place. And right around that same time, George told us that he also completed Cersei Lannister. That one had been giving him trouble, right? He completed Jaime's POV as well and Brienne in the Riverlands. And one of the last updates he gave us on what he was actually writing in Winds is Arya. He's writing Arya down in Bravos, right? Arya may be coming back to Westeros in this book. It's amazing. I can't wait. We've never had... Uh, in my opinion, this much of a chance of getting wins within the next year or so. Okay, uh, speaking of, that's a good segue into, like, an actual release date. Now, I uh, have said this four separate times since completing my first read of the Song of Ice and Fire, so I'm going to tread carefully, but I, I really do wholeheartedly believe that the Winds of Winter 
will have a release date by the time House of the Dragon Season 2 comes out. And if it doesn't, well then I'm going to update my wins release date and postpone it for past Season 2 of House of the Dragon. Like, it's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating to, uh, obviously to wait on wins a winner, but it's more frustrating for me to, like, get my hopes up and then say in a video, hey, this book is coming at this date because, well, I'm not George R. R. Martin, right? But also, like, I can't help but have hope because the story is so good. So, like I just said before, I think the book will be out within the next year, right? Uh, you all let me know what you think down below in the comment section. Do, like, there's probably going to be a good chunk of viewers that are watching this that don't think that Winds of Winter is coming at all. Let me know why down below in the comment section, please. And also, if you do think it's coming, but it's going to be like five plus years, right? Let me know that down below in the comment section as well. Okay, so this is the next part of the video. Um, if you watched this far, thank you so, so much. Please tap the like on it and subscribe. Um, it was requested by a Dragon Tier member, Dragon Knight Tier member over on my Patreon. If you're uh, super interested uh, in showing me some extra support and want a little bit of extra content, consider checking out my Patreon. It's over on patreon.com slash your hunch reviews. Over the next several weeks, I plan on revamping most of the tiers and Patreon rewards. So if you are considering joining, maybe wait until uh, the beginning of July before making that leap into doing so because there's a bunch of changes coming to Patreon. Um, as of right now, there's only two tiers that you can join at i think so like i said a bunch of that uh a bunch of my patron stuff is going to be revamped over the next uh, few weeks so if you do want to join just uh, maybe wait before doing so um but this was requested by tyler schnabel he wanted me to talk about uh victorian and euron and their deeper magic and it just so happens that well he knows this and i'm pretty sure most people watching this know this victorian and euron Aside from Daenerys, Jon Snow, and Davos, and Arya, and Sansa, and, uh, well, Lady Stoneheart, and Jaime, and Brienne, <laughs> and all the other POVs, right? Victarion and Euron are my favorite plot lines, right? So, one of the reasons why I love Victarion so much is because before I actually started reading Song of Ice and Fire books, people kept telling me how Victarion is, George, is, George has said that Victarion is his dumbest character. Like, Victorion is so stupid that um, he is, uh, it's comical in his decision making, in his plot line, right? So then when I read it, I'm like, I kind of had heard that, but I didn't really, like, hear it, uh, you know, recent. So I was kind of like, let's check out this Victorion dude, right? Um, you know, he's sort of set up in the King's Moot uh, through Asha's POV, and then Theon thinks about him a few times through his POV. But, uh, like, when he becomes a point-of-view character, you really see, oh, this guy <laughs> kind of does think a little bit stupidly, right? So one of the things that's happening right now is he is actually one of the closest POV members to Essos that's from Westeros outside of Tyrion. So the reason why that's exciting is because in the King's Moot, Euron is named King of the Iron Islands. He sends Victarion to go and get his bride. He gives Victarion this horn known as Dragonbinder, right? Um, and Victarion had just saw the horn blow at the King's Moot. Euron had one of his mongrels blow this Dragonbinder horn and it roasted him from the inside out. So then he gives this horn to Victarion and he says, yo, my sail halfway across the world and bring me back my bride. Uh, and that's what he does. He, he literally, it's, it's, I feel like a dummy for liking him so much, but it's amazing. He literally say, uh, sails the, the the seas of, of Planetos, right? This is the planet that this story is set on, and he captures ships. Sometimes he sacrifices their crews, right? Sometimes he keeps some of their crew members as slaves. But for the most part, he's adding ships to his massive fleet of ships that he's going to use to rescue Daenerys and bring her home to Westeros. So that is why I am the most excited about Victarion's POV, right? Victarion is not Euron in the sense that he's stupid and can be manipulated. And mind you, he does have this horn that supposedly binds dragons, but I think it's more of a thing that, like, he's going to get a dragon's attention and stun it 
and then someone can attempt to mount it or something right like i you got to realize that magic does not work the way the user thinks it will in a song of ice and fire like maesters for the most part know this right because in their course of study they find out they have to do this thing like try to light a um, something called a glass candle when a maester finishes all their training, they have to try to light it. And none of them really ever do. And the whole lesson is that is there are some things, no matter how much knowledge or information you have, there are some things that you will never know about, right? And magic is one of those things that never works the way it's supposed to in the sense that, like, you might get a little bit of what you were looking for, but the, the recourse and the action after that is not at all what you wanted to deal with, right? So Victarion uh, knows that whoever blows the horn is going to burn, so he's got... Um, several different individuals that he tasks with blowing the horn, but ultimately Euron's going to blow it again himself, and he may bind a dragon or uh, continue roasting from the inside out, because one of the things that happens to Victarion early on is he gets into a fight uh, on the Shield Islands, or right outside the Shield Islands, doing work for Euron, right? The, the uh, Greyjoys and the Ironborn have gone back to reaving the old ways, so they're like, Victarion's got his fleet outside of Old Town, and uh, oh, I'm sorry, Euron has his fleet outside of Old Town, and Victarion sailing his fleet around Westeros and attacking the Shield Islands on the way, and like he ends up getting into a fight with this dude, um, who cuts his hand. Now the cut becomes infected. Really, it's being uh, the cut like would have healed, but the Maester and um, Victarion's bedchamber were given to him by Euron, and Euron wants to keep him weak, so. One of them, either the maester or the dusky woman, was poisoning uh, Victarion's hand. But anyway, Victarion, in the course of sailing across the world, finds this dude, Makoro, floating in the ocean. Makoro just so happens to be this red priest who uh, was in a shipwreck um, with Tyrion, right? Tyrion is that close to... Den Obviously, Tyrion is a slave... Um, and he's over in Essos as well, in Slaver's Bay, and he's, like, about to fight Daenerys' army. <laughs> or, uh, you know, with Brown Bim Plum, who at one point was a part of Daenerys' army, but that's besides the point. So, he finds the dude Makoro, who's this fire priest, in the ocean, and he heals his hand. Uh, it's, it's, it's not just, like, a straight-up healed hand, because Victarion, uh, uh, realizes that the hand isn't healing, but doesn't realize, like, completely exactly what's going on. So, Victarion goes into his room with Makoro, the dude that he found floating in the ocean, who's a fire priest that also was involved in Tyrion's plotline. And Makoro says all these spells and rituals, and ends up healing Victarion's hand, but it looks like a smoking, soldering fist, like, with crackling, poor crackling skin on it, but it's stronger than it's ever been, right? So, I feel like if Victarion does blow the horn... Right? There's a chance that if it burns him on the inside, he would continue being Azor High. I don't... <sighs> it's so much involved and wrapped in with that plot line. But one of the interesting things, or in my opinion, the most interesting things about Euron is the fact that Euron had a dragon, dragon's egg, right? Supposedly has sailed to the ruins of Valyria, right? And also, he plans on summoning a kraken with a ship full of blood. Like, there's, there's some proof that he's been to... Uh, Valyria, but Roderick the Reader, who is Theon and Asha's uncle, uh, questions him because he's like, well, nobody's been to Valyria, right? And Roderick the Reader is like the, one of the smartest individuals in all of the Song of Ice and Fire, in my opinion, just from some of the things that he says to Asha during her POV when she's visiting with him before she takes off to go to the King's Mood. So in my opinion, um... Uh, we well, gotta realize Victarion has been traveling the world before he kills Balon with the Faceless Men, and he he's collecting priests from all these different faiths and religions, and then he sacrifices them to his uh, faith and religion, the Drowned God. He also has been slitting their throats and collecting their blood and letting the blood fill up in this cog, right? That his brother Aaron Dampere sees in the cog, which is like this big ship with a big belly on it, right? It's filled with blood. Um, his brother Aaron sees this ship out in the waters of Old Town where they're about to attack. So there's only one reason why Euron would have a ship full of blood, right? You would think, oh, well, he's sacrificing to his drowned god. Yes, he's doing that, but also he's summoning a kraken. A kraken from the deep, um, giant squid octopus type creature that's going to come and wreak havoc on all the ships that are going to be sent out. At least Euron thinks... They're going to wreak havoc on all the ships that are sent out by the high towers in Old Town, right? But really, 
the Kraken is most likely going to destroy Euron and his fleet, in my opinion, right? So we're going to more so be focusing on Victorion's plotline after Euron is killed. Euron doesn't have a POV, and Euron is one of those characters where, like, he's so mysterious and magical, and he's built up, and you think he's going to do something great and terrible, but really probably going to be wiped out by his own machinations, that being trying to summon a Kraken. This seems like a really good point to wrap this video up. I want to thank you all so, so much for watching. Please slap a like on this video. Let me know your thoughts on some of the things I just said. And also, please tell me what you're most excited for in the Winds of Winter. My name's Mark. This has been Sir Hunt's Reviews. Please consider subscribing to my second channel over on uh, Mr. Westeros. It's here on YouTube. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Super special shout out to every single member of my Dragon Knight tier over on Patreon. They are the North Must Remember, Brianne Johnson, Tyler Schnabel, and Destiny Mixed Queen Phillips420.